Throughout history, God has found creative ways to connect with humankind. We saw God's creative communication when we celebrated Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit through wind and fire. We saw God's creativity as the world was created through word, as God considered the intricacies of each aspect of creation that would need to fit together perfectly to help us flourish, and as God considered each part of creation and deemed it good. Today we are going to consider creative hospitality how we can learn from the hospitality of Abraham and Sarah and the possibilities of our creative God. In order to get into the scripture that we just heard, let us take a moment to remember Abraham and Sarah's story up to this point. We meet Abraham, then called Abram, in Genesis 11, where he is listed in a long genealogy. We realize, however, in Genesis 12, that there is something important about Abram and his wife, Sarai. In Genesis 12, God speaks to Abram and tells him to leave his country, to leave the home that he has known leave his family, and go to a new land, a land that God has yet to disclose to him, a land that Abram doesn't know. This would take an immense amount of trust. Moving even today is not a decision that we make lightly, when Justin and I considered leaving Louisville, Kentucky, even though it was to go back to school to set up the opportunity for a better job in the future, and even though it meant that we were moving back to my hometown where we would be near family, it was still a difficult decision to leave our jobs, our friends, and our home. We are happy with the decision we made, of course. Home for Abram was linked with identity, financial security, land security, and his ancestry. And Abram, Abram made the decision to leave his home and his extended family, and he didn't even know where he was going. God didn't just ask Abram to leave, however. God made promises to Abram and Sarai. God promised that they would have many descendants, that God would make of him a great nation. God also promised that Abram would be blessed. And then once they began traveling, God showed them the land of Canaan and said, To your offspring I will give this land. These promises sound amazing, but I'm guessing Sarai and Abram were a bit confused. See, Abram was 75 when they left, and Sarai was a similar age. They were a little past the age of having children. So they come up with a plan, and Abram has a child with Hagar, Sarai's handmaid, and the child was named Ishmael. When Abram is 99, God changes his name to Abraham as a sign of the covenant that they make together. And as God tells Abraham about this covenant, God says that Sarai's name will be changed too, that she would now be called Sarah. And God says, I will give you a son by her. Their plan wasn't what God had intended. Abraham, Abraham's descendants would come from Sarah. <coughs> and Abraham laughs. It is here that we pick up with the part of Abraham and Sarah's story that we read today. Where the Lord appears to Abraham as three people. Abraham follows the traditional gestures of hospitality, going out to greet them, bowing, inviting them in, pouring water to drink and to wash their feet, 
and offering food. But Abraham goes above and beyond the customs of hospitality. He provides a calf to eat, the best of what he has. He goes and he asks Sarah to make some bread with three measures of choice flour. For the cooks in the congregation, three measures of flour is about 20 quarts. And for those of you who can't do a lot of quick math in your head, I had the advantage of Google earlier in the week. Abraham just asked Sarah to make somewhere between 24 and 45 loaves of bread for the three guests. This is what Bishop Robert Schnazy has coined as radical hospitality. It is hospitality that goes above and beyond ordinary practice. It is drastically different from the norm. And we are to follow in Abraham's footsteps. While it's possible that this story is exaggerated, the irrationally large quantity of flour that Abraham asks for signifies to us how we should be treating others. Abraham is hosting God in his home, but he doesn't know it, at least not yet. To him, these are three ordinary strangers, and yet he still treats them with such hospitality, such respect, welcome, generosity, and care. Aren't we called to do the same? When we have visitors in our church, how are we extending hospitality to them? Are we greeting them, helping them feel welcome, showing them where the kids' Sunday school rooms are or where to pick up a bulletin? When we have visitors in our outreach center, those coming for the food pantry or the clothes closet, how are we welcoming them? Are we treating them with respect and care? Are we taking a genuine interest in them? But hospitality is also more than just how we treat the strangers in our church. We also need to be asking ourselves, how do we as Christians show hospitality to the strangers we encounter every day of our lives? Strangers throughout the Bible are those deemed as other, those different from us, even those whom society often deemed as unacceptable or despised. So how are we paying attention to and caring for those different to us? Abraham didn't know who these three strangers were, but he treated them with radical hospitality. This doesn't mean that Abraham always got radical hospitality right. Abraham doesn't always remember what it even means to be hospitable. As we see just a few chapters later in Genesis 21, when Abraham and Sarah send Hagar away. Hagar is born Abraham's son, but they reject her. She is no longer, she no longer has a home with them. She is given some bread and water and just sent away with her son. And she and Ishmael could have easily died in the desert. Thankfully, God's hospitality takes over and Hagar and her son are cared for. A story we will hear more about next week. But let's get back to our passage for today. The first half of the passage follows Abraham and how he treats these three visitors, but the second half gives us a view into Sarah's role. Sarah has made the bread, this extravagant quantity that Abraham requested, and she must be curious about the visitors who have inspired such hospitality from Abraham. And so she positions herself at the entrance of the tent and she overhears their conversation. One of the guests says, I will surely return to you in due season, 
and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. This means that their plan to have Abraham's descendants from Hagar was wrong, and that Sarah would still give birth to a child. And, not surprisingly, Sarah laughs. Sarah knows that she and Abraham cannot conceive. I'm sure she has grieved over that fact. I'm sure she's been angry and she has felt great loss. And she's old, very old. But God made a covenant with Abraham years before this moment. God promised descendants to him and Sarah. And we might say that God can be laughably creative at fulfilling promises. Because we find a few chapters later that Sarah has conceived. And at the age of about 99 or 100, she gives birth to a son. Abraham names the child Isaac, a name which means he laughs. He laughs, a perfect name for such a situation. Because Abraham laughed when he heard in chapter 17 that he and Sarah would have a child together. And Sarah laughed in chapter 18 when she heard that she would be the one to give birth to the child who would fulfill the covenant. And in chapter 21, Isaac is born with the name he laughs as a way to remember the miracles of God. And as Sarah later says, because God has brought laughter for me. Now I want to make it clear that Isaac is not a gift for Abraham and Sarah because they were hospitable. He was not a reward because they did as they should. Isaac was part of God's covenant from the very beginning. He was part of the plan, even if Abraham and Sarah didn't realize it at the beginning. At the end of our passage, one of the visitors asks, Why did Sarah laugh? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? This can also be translated as, is anything too hard for the Lord? This question, I think, is not meant to accuse Sarah for laughing. Abraham was not condemned for laughing in the previous chapter, and so it would be strange for Sarah to be condemned for the same action. But... As scholar Terence Fretheim writes, the question moves Abraham and Sarah beyond their limited view of the future to a consideration of God's possibilities. So now we move the story forward to today. What opportunities to share God's message of love to the world do you think are beyond your capability. And so you laugh at them like Sarah did. What possibilities might there be for our church and for our own lives if we ask the question, is anything too hard for the Lord? What new opportunities might arise if we allow ourselves to dream alongside God as we hope and plan for our future. God isn't always going to grant the desires of our hearts, but we must allow ourselves to dream. We must allow ourselves to be open to the various ways in which God may fulfill the promises made to us. Throughout Scripture, God acts in unexpected ways. God uses regular people such as Abram, Sarai, Moses, and Aaron, and the list just goes on. Not outstanding people, not always the powerful, rich, or super intellectual. It is part of God's will for us to be open to the possibilities while continuing to extend 
radical, generous, and extravagant hospitality to those whom we encounter in our church, in our outreach center, and in our everyday lives. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.